Hey everyone, this is Vaughn Vernon. Thanks for joining me again in my Design Accelerator tutorials. Today I'm going to be talking to you about transforming a legacy big ball of mud. What are some of the techniques that can be used to do that? Does it mean that you have to break up the big ball of mud into microservices or are there other benefits to doing this? And in particular, I'm going to share with you some information about how to publish events out of the legacy big ball of mud and how that can benefit you in the transformation process. My Design Accelerator tutorials are brought to you by my company, Kalele. You can find us at kalele.io and you can find out more information about my IDD workshop and other workshops available through us at kalele.io slash IDDD dash workshop. There are several ways that you can transform a legacy big ball of mud. Today I'm going to be discussing mostly those that relate to publishing domain events. And I'm familiar with three different ways of doing that. One of the first ways uses database triggers. This is a form of change data capture. The second way is by servicing domain events that are implicit in the source code, but not explicitly defined. And the third way is to use transaction log streaming, which is a different form of change data capture. So I'll discuss each of these today and primarily the use of transaction log streaming. And I'll discuss this third way primarily today. It's never always the best way, but it may be the best way under certain circumstances. And I'll explain the trade-offs of each of those. Let's consider the first approach using database triggers, a form of change data capture. The basic idea here is when an entity is persisted to the database, and we're assuming a relational database that supports triggers here, the first thing that happens is the entity is persisted to a database table. That table will then cause a trigger to be activated and the data from this row will be available to the trigger. The trigger will then generate an event and persist that event into a separate table. Let's say that that table would be known as the events table. And the events table is then read in some way and the event is placed into a messaging mechanism such as a bus or a broker and that becomes available to anyone who is interested in the specific topic or exchange that is available through that messaging mechanism. Note now that this dashed box represents a transaction. And what I've done is provided four different examples of how transactions might be scoped. This approach using triggers works well when there is simply a single entity, as you see here in 1A, that is within a single transactional scope. This means that all of the data that's needed for the entity is provided in a single row to the SQL trigger, and that can be used to create a domain event. The challenge comes in when, as you see here in B and C, the scope of the transaction might change over different use cases, and you might have to create the exact same event from different transactional scopes. Or you have a single very large row of denormalized data that actually represents logically multiple entities and all of those are persisted together, what does that actually mean? Does it mean that there are, let's say, three different events for the logical three different entities that are persisted together in this denormalized record? What exactly does it mean? Well, each of these situations, the B, C, and D situations can introduce challenges. And I'll get back to how you might solve this but it can be 
quite challenging to deal with these different forms, although 1A is the best way to utilize this. In a legacy system, it can very often be the case where multiple entities are persisted, but the same entities are persisted in different scopes, in different numbers of entities, or as you see here, this one large entity could be persisted. And each of these might need to produce the same kind of event or even multiple events, depending on the kinds of data that is persisted in any given time. I'll touch on this again, along with the use of transaction log streaming for change data capture in a few moments. Consider now the second approach, surface domain events and source code. This works on the premise that, in essence, events always exist, even if they exist only implicitly. So the idea here is to understand what is being modified in an entity and how can that be surfaced into now an explicit domain event. The entity and the domain event will then be persisted together in a single transaction to two different tables. The entity will be persisted to its own table and the domain event into an events table. After this persistence has been accomplished, the transaction has been committed, then a background process of some kind will read the new domain event from the events table and put it into the messaging mechanism. Again, this is a bus or a broker of some kind. The third approach is to use transaction log streaming. It is yet another form of change data capture. The idea is when an entity is modified and persisted to the database and that transaction is committed, it is committed to the transaction log. It is not yet written into the table for that entity. Once it is persisted to the transaction log, there is a transaction log listener that is registered and the transaction log listener receives each log data, that is each separate transaction commit, and that data when received by the listener can be translated into an event. The event in turn can then be placed into a message topic or exchange for publish subscribe. Afterward, the transaction log data is also then persisted to the table as part of the overall transaction processing of the database. There is part that's missing here though. Can you detect an important step that's been omitted? Perhaps you noted that the event that the listener creates is not first being persisted to an events table before it is sent to the messaging mechanism to be published. I think this is an important step because we're not treating events just as an ephemeral notification of something that has occurred. Instead, we consider the events an important part of the overall domain. And think of the benefit of persisting all events that the listener has created. The point of this is that those events can be used again in the future for seeding other kinds of subsystems. For example, as you're picking off different microservices, for example, from the big ball of mud, it could be important to republish those events for each microservice that is newly created. If you don't intend to use microservices, then you could be publishing an event to a newly identified subdomain in a modular monolith. So which one of these approaches should you use? As always, the correct answer is it depends. Change data capture can have a big advantage, but choosing between these two can be more or less a complicated answer. For one thing, I think that the transaction log streaming is likely a more straightforward approach because if you're using database triggers, it means that you're going to have to write the trigger itself. You're going to have to write SQL code internally. It's likely going to be simpler for you to write a listener that can then translate the transaction log data into domain events. So as always, it depends. Now, 
to think about this one. It could seem simpler to do this in some ways. However, I think that this is the better choice if you plan on keeping the monolith together. That is, the monolith would outlast the refactorings, the redesigns that you would do in order to get uh, the model working properly. You would likely want to decouple the tangle that you find in here between entities, between services and entities and so forth. But in doing so, you'll also have to think in terms of how to loosely couple through domain events, which is what I've just been discussing. So there is a chance that if you are planning on keeping the monolith around and perhaps just selectively pulling out some of the subdomains, the bounded context within that you eventually are able to create to divide off as modules, then you're probably going to benefit by using this approach. And that way, when you pull out or break off one of the separate subdomains into a, an autonomous microservice, it's going to be fairly simple to do so because you'll already have a lot of the infrastructure in place and you will be listening to events already. And the only difference will be that there is now a network dividing a microservice off from the modular monolith. But don't misunderstand, this is difficult work. It's not something that's just going to happen overnight or even over a month or so. If you have a true big ball of mud, a very complex tangle, it's going to take time to develop tests, to modularize, to break apart the, to, to really decouple the coupled aspects and to, in essence, use events to support eventual consistency between dependent entities over time. So there's a lot of work to do in order to reach that point. As I indicated earlier, it's possible with any of these approaches, the two different change data capture approaches of using database triggers or using transaction log streaming, or even when surfacing domain events out of source code, that the entities that are persisted may have too little information provided in them to derive one meaningful domain event. What can we do about this? Well, as you notice, there are two transactions represented here and three different entities. The three different entities in the two transactions themselves could only derive scant domain events or scant events. As you can see, event A, B, and C. So how would we potentially piece these together to create a full meaningful event that could be published downstream? One way to accomplish this is as the scant events are persisted, you can project them into a temporary view, if you will, basically a place to persist temporary state. And as the scant events are accumulated inside this temporary state, when the last event is received, it can be projected to yet another event, the actual full meaningful domain event. I know you're probably thinking, but what if A, B, or C doesn't show up? Well, that could be a problem, but the point that this calls out is you have to know your use cases. You have to understand under what conditions the scant events will occur, will be derived and persisted. And if you don't understand those, you could easily get caught with this situation, uh, basically an event being stuck in the temporary holder and never being produced. This could, of course, happen on a rollback uh, when the scant events happen in separate transactions caused by uh, separate users. There could be a lot of reasons why this is the case. That means that you probably want to have some kind of a timer that looks after these scant events, the partial temporary collections of them, to see whether these have been abandoned and perhaps clean them up um, or find out what happened, why this is lacking. So 
There isn't a really great answer for this other than keep it tidy. Try to make sure that you're looking after all of the data as much as possible. There is no perfect answer to this. It's a difficult process to completely clean up and modularize your big ball of mud to extract microservices from it. So you're going to have to experiment. You're going to have to try a lot of different options. I have been successful though with each of these approaches, so I have no doubt that you could succeed with them. This tutorial has been based on Strategic Monoliths and Microservices, the book that Tomasz Jaskula and I co-authored, and I encourage you to look into it for more detail. There's quite a bit more covered in the book. I'll try to follow up with more topics later on, but I hope that you'll pick up a copy of it and study it. I think you'll learn a lot. Uh, focus on the words strategic and innovation. Strategic monoliths and microservices driving innovation using purposeful architectures. So first of all, strategic innovation. Monoliths and microservices are tied up in the idea of purposeful architecture. So you're going to be encouraged to have a reason for de determining whether you will use monoliths or microservices or a bit of both of them. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Again, it's brought to you by my company, Kalele. You can find us on the web at kalele.io and you can learn more about my IDDD workshop at kalele.io slash IDDD workshop. Thanks and I'll see you for the next tutorial.